All right. So, like I said, thanks for being here. Uh, if this late, we've uh, so half the class is, is stopped coming. I don't know if you noticed, mm -hmm. but that's okay. And on the video, I was actually watching session five, part one, to get ready for this one, part two, and I was watching it, and I was just blown away at just how good that stuff is, how good that information is. It's so good. And when I was listening to it, you guys are getting it. I mean, I hear you guys talking back to me on what I was saying, and you guys were participating. So it's, it's good. It is really good. It's good stuff. In fact, I got to the end of watching session five, part one, and I'm thinking, I don't remember saying all that stuff. <laughs> I'm like, wow, that was good. So maybe it was just meant for me. I don't know, but uh, it was really good. So thank you guys for still being here. Um, today's quote, your soul already knows the answer. You just have to be quiet enough to hear it, and here it is, and brave enough to listen. You just have to be quiet enough to hear what your soul already knows. Because when he knit you together in your mother's womb, he put himself in there. He put eternity in your heart. He put it there inside of you. So you've already got it. I mean, when he knit you together, right? He, he, that was what he started with, the DNA. And then it's the I am nots that keep showing up around it. But he starts with that, so it's already in you. Your soul already knows the answer. But your soul gets so busy listening to the I am nots and to all this stuff going on on the outside that you don't hear what you already know. So you have to just be quiet to listen. Today we're going to talk about the face-to-face -face and the importance of the face-to-face. -face. And there is more going on in a face-to-face -face encounter than we realize. It is so powerful what happens in the face-to-face. -face. Um, so we're going to get into that some. Um, uh, by the time we close out, if we have enough time, which I think we will because we should be able to fly through this pretty quick. I'll do a quick recap of part, five, of part one, session five. And then we'll jump in the last two pages of uh, session five. And then I'm going to close it out with um, some of what uh, centering uh, prayer, what meditation kind of looks like. Uh, how to help yourself through that time. Because we don't know how to do it. We, we don't know how to properly meditate. You know why? Because this right here is always talking to us. So this bad. right here is always talking to us. I can guarantee you, if I said, let's have, you know, two minutes of silence, your brain is going a thousand miles an hour on everything else except for quiet. I mean, your mouth's not moving, but your brain still is. So part of this just have to be quiet is not just shutting your mouth. Part of the have to be quiet is shutting this down enough that you can encounter the face-to-face, -face, that you can... Start seeing what's going on right here that, that Father, Spirit, and Son can start ministering to you right here on things that you don't even know what's going on. It's, it happens at a molecular level in your, in your being. It happens to you. That's what's so nice about it. You don't have to figure it out. You just have to get quiet. And it happens. You don't have to have a checklist of things that you got to do you know, to fix your life. You just get quiet in the face-to-face -face with permission. You're just giving permission for whatever Father wants to do. Not my will, but your will be done. Whatever you want to do. You sit there in that quiet, and things begin to change in your life. Things begin to change. It's that, that pause that uh, is difficult getting used to. Yeah. You know, when just here recently, I finally... I've got maybe five or ten seconds of it. Nice. You know, um, not much. No. You know, and then I start going, oh, but, you know, I'm not thinking of anything. Or, or, yeah. So I'm thinking of something. You know, instead of just leaving it on pause for me. 
Oh. Yeah. So, so yeah, Jerry and I had a conversation about a week and a half ago or something. Yeah. I started telling him about some of this meditation stuff that I asked him to kind of put into put into practice, start doing. And part of that was that having that word pause in there, and and that word pause, and it helped him to start letting go of this mind going 100,000 miles an hour, and then you have three to five seconds. You may get, in a 20 minute time, when I do my, my meditation time, when I do my centering prayer, when I do my, my pause time, I may only have, in 20 minutes, I may have 30 seconds or a minute of nothing bouncing around. And it is so peaceful. It is so resting. You go to sleep at night to rest, but your brain never does. Your brain keeps going. It's full of dreams. They can watch your brain waves just go 100 miles an hour still. So are you really getting rest? Well, maybe your body is, but you're waking up just as tired as when you went to bed because your brain never shut down. So this face-to-face -face with the pause, with the getting quiet and learning how to get quiet in the pause, in that face-to-face, -face, causes your brain to slow down and actually really does give you rest. The way I always looked at it is that the spirit, the soul, never sleeps. That is, the body needs to sleep. And I say this because at times we can not see somebody for a very long time, and then all of a sudden we think about that person. And I believe that the soul is so powerful that it could communicate with other souls. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we do that while the body's sleeping, and we can call out to each other's souls, and then you run into this person and say, hey, I was just thinking about you. Yeah. And that, you think it's a, a coincidence, but it's not. No, it's not. Um, um, my gingerbread man guy, remember him? And how from one man God created, actually this is more of a little bit bigger head. <laughs> from one man, well you gotta make it look like a gingerbread. You look kind of like Gumby there for a man. <laughs> so, but from one man God created all the nations. And that means throughout all of time, People are showing up and they're, they're coming and being a part of, of history, right? They're, they're showing up. And if this was a 3D, if we were to do this like in a 3D, or it was like this, and the head kind of around like that, then we would see this, that they would be showing up in different times. It's at different seasons and different times throughout the body and in different layers. It's in different layers that he's showing up. So... You know, to see the body in a 3D, let me put it to you this way. This is something that he gave me about four or five years ago. Really good. So everybody, look at your hand. Look at the back of your hand. And now as you're looking at the back of your hand, I want you to kind of, using your imagination, I want you to see the different cells of your, of your body, of your skin, right? And then with your imagination, you kind of see even deeper. You see the different cells of the blood cells that are, that are in there and even deeper of, of the muscle and the bone. And you know, each one of those cells, they just kind of go throughout your whole body to this 3D level in your hand. And you see each one of those cells. Now, on each one of those cells in your hand, put a face. That's the body of Christ. You represent the body of Christ. So just as all of your cells make up your body, each individual person makes up the body and it's has layers so and how each one is connected and how okay so the heart the heart makes more heart cells but see when we start going and last week I talked about going from me to we we got to go from me to we this is me what about me what about me what did I deserve why 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 it's all about me and then when you start getting into this it's about we. That's about we. That's the, that's the soul connected to another soul. So just like the heart, or those things, like the lungs even, the lungs, the lung cells, right? They, oxygen comes in and they absorb the oxygen. But they don't hold on to it for themselves. They absorb the oxygen and they pass it on to the blood. And then the blood cells take it to other parts of the body. So they all function together. That's why Paul said we have many parts and not all parts of the body serve the same function. When we start going from me, 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 because I'm an isolated by myself only individual to a we, we start seeing that yes, 
We are all connected. We start looking at everybody different. We start treating them different. I can tell you for me personally, and since I've been doing this for the past couple of months, I've only been doing this meditation thing for a couple of months. Huge difference. What I have noticed in my time, as at first it's, it's really tough. At first it's like, I can't do this, you know? At first I have this timer that I have on, my, on, my, on this app on my phone, and it's supposed to count down from 20. And so when at first, when I first started doing it, I was like, start it, and I'm like, ah, that's like, it's got to be about a half hour right now. I look down, two minutes. Wow! This is going to be a long 20 minutes, you know, because it just, it seems like it takes forever. But now, it's like it goes by pretty fast. It's starting to pick up where it goes faster to where I'm enjoying that breath. I'm enjoying that pause. My mind is starting to rest during that time. And I notice that it's starting to change me. I'm starting to really have more of a compassion for the rest of the world. I was driving up to Craig during hunting season. And as I'm driving down the highway, I'm the only one on the highway, I see this big old bull elk come running down the hill and across the road in front of me, running. And somehow I connected eyes with him and I felt his fear. I saw the fear in his eyes as he was running. And all of a sudden, I was just moved with such compassion for this elk that I was like, I felt sorry for him. I was mad at hunters all day that day. <laughs> so I'm up there at the Walmart and stuff, I'm like, just get out of here, you know? <laughs> but I felt this compassion for God's creation. And I realized that's the way Jesus feels for his creation. That's the love that he has for all of his creation. So in this face to face, when we learn to be quiet and get our mind to shut up, it starts changing us. It just starts changing us and we don't necessarily know what it's changing, but it's changing us. But we have to endure it. I got a, I got a supplemental handout before we get started. So I'm gonna keep one and have you guys pass back and pass back. These are additional notes. They need to grab one of those from back there, too. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's correct. Okay, here's you some want? supplemental notes. Yeah. Everybody's got one. Yeah, you got you just hold on to them. I'll pick it for us later. Okay. And this is more of the me to we stuff. Okay, this is more of the me to we stuff. So I'm just going to read this. Okay. All, and this is stuff that, that came to me while I've been on the road this past few weeks. And so I had to like take my phone out and record while I'm driving, because I don't text it. I record while I'm driving, save it in the notes, and then pull it all together later. So here it is. All of that anger that I want to unload on those around me is just the anger that I want to unload on God, but can't. My, I'm angry because those things that I want to control are out of my control. So I'm angry at those things because I'm not in control. Wow. That's why we get angry. Because that didn't go the way I thought it was supposed to, and I'm upset because it's not going the way I want it to go. Well, who says just because it's not going the way I want it to go, it's not going the way it's supposed to go? Mm -hmm. Who needs to adjust, that or me? So it's time for me to examine on how I need to adjust me. Right, okay. Now I got a few quotes in here. Here's a quote from Eckhart Tolle. You guys ever heard of him? Eckhart Tolle? No. Okay. The greatest difficulty is the mental resistance to things that arise and the underlying assumption that they should not. There again is control the moment. This thing popped up and now it's interfering with what I had planned. So now I'm upset because that shouldn't be that way. So that's what we think. Yeah, it shouldn't be that way. Well, who are we to say it's not supposed to be that way? Right? There's another one from Eckhart Tolle. What you react to in another, you strengthen in yourself. Remember what you focus on, you become one with. That was part one of session five. What you focus on, you become one with. So when you recognize that stuff in those people that drive you crazy, you're looking at yourself. 
You're looking at yourself, and that's why it drives you crazy and makes you mad and gets you upset. Because that's you, and you don't like that in you. That is you, this I am not stuff, and you don't like it because in the core of you, you know that's not how it's supposed to be. And you don't like it in them, so you see it in them, you see yourself in them. And that's what makes us mad. And we don't like it. So we take it out on them. Who should we be taking it out on? We need to focus on ourselves. We need to get quiet and let the change happen. We need to say, if I'm upset about that, it's not them, it's me. What is it in me that doesn't like this situation? The only person I can change is me. I can't change people, I can't change places, and I can't change things. I have no control over all and everything except for me. So I need to work on me. That's the only thing I can change. And what happens as I change me, I actually don't change them, but they look different and they don't bother me anymore. As I grow, as I change me, those people don't bother me anymore. Their stupidity doesn't bother me. Because now it's not stupidity. Now it's, I only saw it as stupidity because I didn't like it in me. Is it, am I making sense here? Yeah? Okay. Here it is. Here's, now we're getting some more. Okay. Um, and, let's see, one, two, three, that for the first part of the, the, the box is there. And, love your neighbor as yourself. That's Matthew 19, 19. Because your neighbor is yourself. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Romans 8, 19. As I change myself, I change my neighbor and the world. Instead of stop, we have to stop trying to change the world and change ourselves. And in changing ourselves, we are changing the world. Remember the, the different cells in your hand. If each cell was trying to change all the other cells, all the other cells, but not themselves, then you have nothing but chaos. But when each cell focuses on doing their job. Just focus on, my, on doing my job. The cells in your hand should not try and be just like the cells in your lungs. They should focus on what they're to be and be the best cell they can be. Be the best hand cell you can be. Be the best lung cell you can be. Don't fight against each other and they call that cancer. Right? When cells start rebelling, they call that cancer. Why do we have cancer? Because we as humans are constantly fighting against what God is doing. We're fighting against each other, and that creates a cancer in society, and in the world, and in our bodies. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> that thing that you are going through, you know, that thing that is driving you crazy, yeah, that's God doing that to you. That's how he does. And that person that is driving you crazy, you know, that person that you just absolutely want to strangle and can't stand being around, yeah, that's God doing that too. That's what he does. And that mountain that you keep going around and around, you know, that mountain you are so sick and tired of doing laps around, yeah, that's God working there too. Working to try to get you to want to grow up. That's what he does. He helps you get so sick of yourself that you decide you want to change. Yeah, that's what he does. And he's very good at it. Ask the Israelites who spent 40 years doing laps in the desert when they were only two weeks from the promised land. Forty years doing laps because they didn't want to grow up. They were two weeks away from the promised land. And it took them 40 years to finally get there because they didn't want to grow up. Do you think Papa's not going to spend 40 years watching you get tired of yourself? Well, you guys still have some time, but... <laughs> well, the Hebrews waited 400 years. Yeah, waited 400 years. Pop, he's not going anywhere. And he knows that we're not going anywhere. So we will eventually get tired of who we are and say, you know what, um, it's time for some changes. It's time to start looking for some answers. And when you start looking for the answers, you find the answers. All right, let's continue on the left hand side, right hand side. It's not having, here we go, it's not having the barbell filled with the weight, fully lifted above your head that changes you, 
It's the process of lifting that weight that changes you. See, it's not, it's not having the weight up here that goes, I'm changed. No, it's the lifting and the pressure and struggle against that that changes you. It's not the finished product. It's the process that changes you. But we want the finished. We just want that barbell up there so we can say, look, but it didn't change us. We have to go through the process of getting it up there for it to change us. We've got to learn to be quiet. We can't just get to the finished line. We can't just get to the finish mark unless we've learned to do some of these and be brave enough to listen. We've got to go through the process. Here we go. Having the trophy doesn't change you into a champion. It is enduring the struggle of practicing and competing for the trophy that makes you a champion, even if you never get the trophy. See, it's not like, and that's, that's part of, I know we've, I've, I've heard, especially from some of the older generation, about they give trophies to everybody now. They don't want me to feel bad. Well, what we've done is we've weakened things because it's not having the trophy, it's competing to get the trophy. It's the journey getting there. It's the journey getting there. It's the process of getting there. It's not the trophy, but we've spent too much time celebrating the trophy and not enough time celebrating the journey. We need to start celebrating the journey and, 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 and empowering people on the journey, not the trophy. The trophy means nothing. It's the journey to get there that means everything. That's what we got to do. Um, you have been called to greatness. Remember, this was last week's quote. You have been called to greatness, true identity. But just like the butterfly, you will never get there if you do not endure the struggle of breaking out of the cocoon, the false identity. You can never, if you try to help a, a caterpillar or a butterfly break out, if you see them starting to break out of the cocoon, and if you go to help them, the butterfly dies. They will die if you help them at all. You can't just take the cocoon off and yay, they're done. They die because they have no strength to fly. It's the struggle of breaking out of that old identity. That process of learning to get quiet and being brave enough to listen while you spend time there. That process of sitting there fighting everything in your brain that tries to make you get up and leave that quiet zone, get away from this meditation, it ain't working. Get up and go do something. Something's got to be done somewhere. Let me get up from here because my brain's going anyway. Let me get up and walk around and go do something else. I'm not going to keep sitting here. That's the struggle. The struggle is to sit in the face-to-face. -face. That's the breaking out of the cocoon that's going on. When we sit here, nobody can help you do that. Nobody can do it for you. It's up to you to do it. And as you do, you are changed. You are changed. And nobody is making the change. That's the whole thing of going through the gate. There's no way, another way. You can't go around or over. Or yeah. under. You have to go through. You have to go through. That's right. And that's why Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through mm -hmm. me. See, here's the process to the Father. There is no, and, and we treat the Father like he's the, like he's the trophy. No, it's the process. It's all about the process. It's all about the getting there. And we've lost that in our church mentality. We've lost that in our spiritual growth. We've lost that in our churches. It's not being taught about enduring. It's, we, we, you know, you go to some of these other countries where they are really being persecuted for being a Christian, they understand the struggle. And you know what? They still do it. They still do it. They will face knowing. And I heard, where was it? One country they were in, I can't remember where this country was, but I heard the story where they said, if you got baptized, and so baptism is a public acknowledgement. You're doing this publicly. It's not like a private in your little private thing. It's a public acknowledgement that something's happening. You're going to do this. You're making this pledge. I'm doing this. This is who I am now. I don't care. In this country, if you get baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the name of Christ, they say the life expectancy is two weeks. 
It's not like it is here. You got baptized. Yeah, yeah, let's celebrate. Now just go live your life however you want to now. It doesn't matter anymore. We've lost the importance of it. Because we've just got the trophy. You got your trophy. You've got your trophy. And we've stopped teaching about the struggle. That's why this class has shrunk. Because this is about the struggle. Because it is about getting there. It's about being ready for the persecution that is coming to this country. <clears throat> it's, it's, it's coming. They leave because they've already gotten their participation trophy. Already got the participation trophy. Hey, yeah. 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 So are, are you guys catching what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got to endure. And, and Jesus said, those that endure to the end Ooh. will partake with me. Mm -hmm. It's the enduring to the end. Okay. There's some more quote. George MacDonald. God is not bound to punish sin. He is bound to destroy sin. In Him I trust that He is destroying sin in me. So that's part of the struggle. That's the process. That's the sitting here while it's going to just work on you. Here's another George MacDonald quote. If He pleases to forget anything, then He can forget it. And I think that is what He does with our sins. That is, after He has gotten them away from us. Once we are clean from them altogether, it would be a dreadful thing if he forgot them before that. He forgets our sin, but he's not going to forget them while we're still struggling with them. That would be terrible. Then we're stuck with them. Mm -hmm. So he can't forgive and just forget about your sin as long as you're struggling with it. So what's he want to do? He wants to free you from it so that he can forget about it. You don't have to deal with it anymore because you're free from it. His he, purpose is to free you. you know, I want to add to that, that he does free you. He does. Even when we sit there and say, God, I prayed and I've asked him and I've asked him, but, you know, I just, there's, nothing's happening. But it's not in our timing. You know, I smoked for 30 years, and I tell you what, out of 30 of those years, 17 of those years, I prayed and asked God to help me quit, to set me free from it. It wasn't until almost a year ago that I was finally set free from it. But it was I was set free from it in a way that other people aren't. I didn't have a craving. I didn't have an urge to do it. It wasn't hard for me. He set me free. Praise God. And the whole time that I was praying, and I didn't see him set me free, I was getting frustrated. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, I don't know how I'm going to ever quit because I'm so stuck on this. But I'm just using cigarettes as an example. There's other things in our lives. Other vices. That, that, yeah. that we're going through. We can't give up because God is working in us. Yeah. And he's going to set us free. We just have to trust him. And, and some of that process that you go through. See, that was a process of kept asking, kept asking, kept asking, kept asking, kept asking, going, 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 going. And then during that time, he's starting to do some work in here. Yeah. And he's doing the work in here that's going to hit that one memory it caused you to think that you were a smoker. Mm -hmm. And he hits that one, and he sets you free from that memory, and then you forget you're a smoker, and you stop smoking. Stop smoking. That's all it is. You forgot you were a smoker. It's not a part of your life. That's not who I am anymore. Yeah. You well, forgot he, who you he were. fills you with something different. Yes. And, and it's like he takes this cup that's full of cigarettes, and he dumps it out and fills it with water. Ah. You know, something that's going to nourish you. Yeah. You know? So he gave me his spirit to distract me from my craving. A distraction? You see? Good. Yeah. And that's what this does too. This 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 does that kind of thing. Because this changes your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Yes. Okay, here we go. There is no crossing the finish line. If God is the finish line and you've crossed it, then you've limited God to your ability to do. If God is infinite, which he is, then you will never reach the end of him. But you will ever be drawn into a deeper union and oneness with him. And then time will come when you too will say, if you've seen me, you've seen my father. There is no finish line. There is no, well, I got my trophy. I got my ticket out of here. That's not what it's about. It's not about just having that bar bill lifted above your head. It's about the process of doing it. Annihilation itself is no death to evil. Here it is. George McDonald sums this up right here. This is why we have to go through this. This is why we have to do this. Annihilation itself is no death to evil. Only good where evil was 
is evil dead. An evil thing must live its evil until it chooses to be good. That alone is the slaying of evil. You don't just cast it out, because then it just comes right back. It's when I choose not to do that anymore. I've made a choice not to do that because now I'm a different person. And so I don't do that. Just like with the cigarettes, you made that choice and so that's gone. You sl you've slayed that, you know? Okay, those are the footnotes. The additional notes. Oh, not bad. So we're going to go through these first couple pages pretty fast here because we've already covered them in session five. Where does true transformation take place? Right here in these chairs, right here in the face-to-face. -face. Okay, so let's just start here on the top, on the, on the left-hand side. Why is a face-to-face -face so important? Because a face-to-face -face is where truth is revealed. It is in a face-to-face -face that true transformation happens, and the mirror is the only place for a true face-to-face. The mirror, James talked about the mirror being the word. If you've heard, the, listen to the word, listen to the scriptures, and it's like a man listening to the scriptures, he said, and then walks away forgetting what he looked like, is like a person that, and, or walks away and doesn't do it, is like the person that looks in the mirror and then forgets what they look like. So he compared scripture to a mirror, saying that's what, if you're looking into scripture, you're seeing who you are. You're seeing Jesus, you're seeing who you are. And I would also add, that the mirror is also those people around you. Aaron? So those people that are, that are around you are also mirroring you as you are mirroring them. And sometimes you're around people that don't like you and you can't figure out why. <coughs> well, it's because they see in you something they don't like in themselves. And they're taking it out on you. When it's not you, it's what you have in you that they see that they don't like about themselves. Make sense? Okay. Here it is. Uh, it's only as we learn to trust Papa that we become comfortable enough to sit with him in a face-to-face -face relationship, naked and unashamed. You've got to be able to trust him to sit there. You, to, to do the meditation time, you've got to be able to trust him enough to let go of wanting to get up and just sit there and just do that time there. Um, what you behold, you become. Okay, let's skip down to where, uh, past that box, it says Eve, because that's the whole story of Eve looking at, the, looking at the fruit, and behold, it was good, and then being captured by it, and wanted it. Because what she beheld, she become one wish. She just had to have it. So Eve, while focused on sin, could not resist sin. When the two ate the tree in the garden, they turned from their face to face with their papa, and instantly fell into darkness. They fell into fear and shame. What you behold, you become one with. When, anytime you turn from the light, you're automatically turning to the darkness. It's just an automatic. Okay, let's skip over to the right-hand side to Job 3.25. You guys find it? Yeah. Job 3.25. This is, uh, the, the other part is when Job went through that, and he was an upright man, but he would constantly be making sacrifices because his kids might, might have done something wrong. So I better make sure that, you know, I got him covered, I'll make a sacrifice mm -hmm. for him. Well, in Job 3, 25, um, he says, What I feared has come upon me. What I dreaded has happened to me. Job, while focused on his fears, brought on his fears. Even though he was blameless and upright, when he turned his face from Papa and faced his fears, those fears came upon him. He became one with his fears. So what you focus on, you become one with. Job was upright. You gotta remember that. Job was an upright, righteous man. And because he focused on losing his kids, he lost his kids. Uh, Jeremiah 2 5. This is what the Lord says. What fault did your ancestors find in me that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. What you focus on, you become one with. Uh, okay, let's skip over to page two. We've already gone through all the other stuff. You can go back and watch session five, part one. Get caught up. 
I, remember, I recommend doing it anyway. Yeah. It was just so good. I know you guys don't remember it either. I forgot all about it. I mean, I forgot how much stuff was in there. I'm like, wow, that was really good stuff. And you guys were participating. You guys were like a part of it. It was just awesome. So I recommend going back and watching it. Let's go all the way down to um, Exodus 20. You guys find that one on the left-hand side? Yeah. Exodus 20, 3 through 4. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an image in the form of anything. In heaven above or on earth, beneath or in the waters below. Because whose image are you made in? Right? We're made in his image. And then I don't know if you guys saw when, when Miss McPhail was here and she taught. And she, she uh, taught on, um, I, I call her identity, an identity teacher, but she taught on, she had that little white figurine. And of all the things that, that um, she thought she was supposed to be to be this perfect Christian woman. You know, married to a pastor. Uh, you know, all these things, you know, have kids, all these things. She had, she kept writing on that, on that little white figurine, all these titles and all these things that her image of what she was supposed to be was there. And what she had done, as we all do, is all those I am nots have become a false image. What did God say? Thou shalt make no graven images. That's exactly what we do. And we call it our false identity. We create ourselves. We idolize ourselves in this image that we have made. That's why it's so hard to let go of it. Those are the things that we're focusing on. Yes. Instead of focusing on God, mm -hmm. we're focusing on these other things. Those are the, the images in our minds, the, the pornography, the, the, the video games, all the stuff that you give yourself to besides God are the things we're making images of. And it says in the Bible that we that we that worship the created things and not the creator. Right. You know? Right. And, and, and I would also add that we, we make an image of who we think we're supposed to be. Yeah. You know, I, I in my personal life, I had become a pastor. So pastor was who I was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to be a servant of God, you got to do this. you got to do this to be this. you got to do this to be this. You know, and you know, you got to be successful. And you got to have lots of money. You got to drive a nice car. Or, you know, all these things that you write down are things that you're supposed to be, and you're creating this image of yourself as an idol that you're focused on instead of sitting here and focusing on this. Mm -hmm. You're right. You're creating all that. So, um, um, ah, you said it right underneath there. <laughs> Right. What you're focusing on, you're becoming one with. Right, that's right. That's the image, the idols that you're. That's right. On. If what you are focusing on has no life in it, what is happening to you? You're dying. If you're focusing on all your false identity stuff, what's happening to you? You're dying. You're dying, and you're mad, and you're angry, and you're upset, and you're mad at everybody else, and your I am nots go out, and their I am nots bounce off you, and your feet off each other, and we just keep going down the spiral. I'm just things getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And we need to stop. We just need to stop. We need to get quiet. We need to be brave enough to <coughs> listen and just sit there and let him change us from the inside out where we have no control. When you come into this face-to-face -face meditation, when you are actually letting go of all those things that you think you're supposed to be in, and you're shutting your mind down, you're learning to ignore all that, you are actually giving up control. You're giving up yes. control of your life. And you're actually giving him permission to change you how he sees fit to, to change you. It's no longer you in control, which is a scary thing because we get used to our control. We like our control. Um, so drop down below that box on the left-hand side. What you are focusing on, you are becoming one with. If the fruit you are focusing on is not the fruit of the Spirit, what is happening to you? And where's the fruit of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's inside of you. It's deep inside of you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. All that is in you. So anytime I find myself and I catch myself not being loving and joyful and peaceful and patient, the wrong fruit's coming up, which means I am focusing on the wrong thing. When I begin to focus here, then the fruit rises to the surface. 
when I'm focused here, me, 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 then I'm not loving, I'm not joyful, I'm not patient, I'm not peaceful, all that stuff. And you can look around you, the people that you know in your life, and you can see that fruit coming up out of their life. You can see that fruit of uh, not joyful, not peaceful. You know, you can see it in their lives. Toss it. You know, oh, here's one. Oh, the marker. Oh, the marker. Yeah. Oh. Any color. All right. <laughs> there you go. I will borrow the eraser. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> can I, can I say something? Like that? Sure. So, you said that we have to let go of our control and let him have control. And I, I, and I agree with you 100%. But sometimes, without knowing that I let go of my control, and I give my control to other people. Uh -huh. And then they control. I allow them to control me in a way where it makes me angry, where it makes me frustrated, where it makes me shout at them behind the wheel in my vehicle going down the road. You know, that's because I've lost, I've given that control away, not to God, but I give it to them. And right. I have to be careful not to do that. Mm. And in that moment, take that control and give it to him. Right. The only place you can give up control is here. Yeah. That's right. And, and, and by giving control, um, you mean you let them walk on you or say bad things yeah. about you? or Meaning that I let what they say and do control what comes out of you. Oh, okay, okay. They you buy into their lives. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, when somebody does something wrong to you, what does Jesus say? He says, turn the other cheek. Right. But nine out of ten of us don't turn the other cheek. No. We let our flesh get the best of yeah. us and we retaliate. Yep. Because you know? because in our mind we're going, that's not supposed to happen that way. Yes. So now we're trying to take control back. Yes. We're trying to take control back and then we get into this match of trying to who's really in control. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's why Jesus said, yeah, turn another cheek. Yeah, walk the extra mile. Hard. Yeah, give them your coat. <laughs> yeah, give them the extra. You know, I, I was really um, I don't know what the big difference between a Buddhist monk and what Jesus was. You know, I, read through, I was reading through Matthew 5, reading through the Sermon on the Mount, mm -hmm. and blessed are you when you do and blessed are you, and blessed are you, and I'm going, man, I've seen the Buddhists say a lot of that stuff. You know, I don't, so I'm like, wow, but it was all about peace. It was all about yeah. peace, and, and it, it was just good stuff. Well, yeah, maybe that's where they got it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so it, it just it hit me that, wow, the Buddhists are more Christ-like than... A lot of Christians, it's true. you know. I like it's true. Wow. I think because a lot of people who who are Christians, they tend to become Pharisees. Uh -huh. And that that's the sad. Because truth. I got my ticket. I got, I got, I got my, my trophy. trophy. I don't. I really got know. my trophy. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I got my trophy. I don't have to change. I got my trophy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. I talked about wherever I react. It's not the fruit of the spirit, so I need to I check myself because something. So whenever I'm reacting to something, and it's not the fruit of the spirit, it's not love, joy, peace, patience, kind of good, it's not that. Well, then I know that somewhere in here in me is a memory that needs touched, that needs healed, that needs let go of, because our memories are what cause our emotions. I don't know if you remember last time when I told this when we had session five, I talked about that nurse friend. There was a, she worked in the trauma unit for brain damage, for brain, and she had a patient that had been in a car wreck, and he could remember nothing prior to the to the car wreck. So when his sister showed up to see him, he had no emotional reaction. He didn't he didn't like her, he didn't dislike her, he didn't know her, so there was no emotional reaction. So our emotions are tied to our memories. So when something happens that hurt us. When something looks like that again, our immediate emotional reaction is that's going to hurt. So we do a fight or flight kind of thing. So that's what happens. So anytime I find myself not reacting with the fruit of the Spirit, I react out of anger, I react out of fear, then I know that there is something in my memory that that situation is touching on. It's a trigger. It's triggering that emotion again. So whenever that happens, it's time to hit the chairs. It's time to come to that face-to-face. -face. It's time to go for a walk. It's time to sit in the car. 
It's time to go in your closet. It's, it's time to just do whatever and get on some face-to-face -face alone time and say, okay, Papa, I'm, I'm letting go. I'm letting go of all that. Help bring healing, touch whatever needs to be healed. I'm giving you permission to be the changes inside of me so that I can be a different person. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, on the right-hand side, top, I am is presence. I am is here now. When we are focused elsewhere, we are not here now. The I am nots are always in a different time zone than now. They're always in the past or the future. I am nots are never present. I am nots are always fearing something and planning for control of the future, or they are always fearing and regretting something from the past. Always. So when I get caught up in my mind in the future or the past, that's my I am not trying to control the situation. I'm trying to control what's going to happen. And then what happens? I try and control what's going to happen in the future. In my mind, this is how it's going to happen. I go out. It doesn't happen that way. Now what? Now I'm upset because it didn't go the way I had planned. That person ruined my plans. That car got in front. That car, you know, whatever it is. If it didn't go the way I wanted it because my I am not said it's supposed to be that way, now I'm upset. Now that I'm upset, I have two choices. I can say, I was obeying my I am not and trying to control, or I can say, all right, Father, bring healing that's making me trying to control. Whatever is there that's making me want to control that situation, help me to, to be healed through that so I can let that situation be that situation. Making sense? Okay. Um, we kind of already touched on the treasure. What you are treasuring becomes one with your soul. What you treasure becomes your identity. This Trapper just talked about that with the video games and all that. That becomes your treasure, and that becomes one with your identity. Um, okay, here we are. 2 Corinthians 3.12. Let's just pick it up right there. And that's where we're going to continue on, because that's where we stopped in session one, is right there. So 2 Corinthians 3.12-18. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was becoming brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains, unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day. Key. To this day. Whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord face to face, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, reflecting, are being transformed into the same image from one degree to, of glory to another. For well, this comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. So, the thing you have to examine is, is the God that you serve, are you, are you being legalistic? Anytime we get caught up in that, that the law, the law, then we, the veil covers the heart and there's no hearing. When we go out to try and evangelize people and we're too busy telling them about the scripture and what the scripture does and you need to really, you know, change and, and you need to repent, brother, and Whatever, we're putting the law on them, and guess what's happening to their heart? It's being veiled. They can't hear what the Spirit is saying because the law is veiling their heart. So if we want to affect them, we need to just let the Spirit be. We need to not come out with the law, we need to just let the Spirit be. We just need to be spiritual. We just need to spend time here. And when you spend time here, you don't have to tell people. You can just be around it, and it starts affecting it. Because you're in the now. And I like when he says that the veil over their hearts, verse 16 there, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Here we go in the face-to-face. -face. When we turn to the face-to-face, -face, the veil is removed. The Lord is spirit, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all we with what? Unveiled faces. You know what that means? We come into this face-to-face, -face, 
and we get rid of the veil. We get rid of our agenda. We get rid of the scripture we've got memorized. We get rid of our plans and what needs changed. We get rid of our list of things and people that need fixed. We get rid of all that. We get rid of that veil because everything that I need to be control of is veiling my face from the face to face. When I let go of all of that, it's no longer me in control. I no longer have my control, my veil. So now, with unveiled faces, it wasn't say with unveiled faces, we uh, beholding His glory, we begin to reflect, are reflecting, are being transformed into the same image from one degree to another. See, when we come to this this face to face, getting rid of our agendas and our lists. And we come face to face, unveiled. There's a transformation that happens that we don't, we don't have an itemized list of what it is. We don't know what's being changed. It's being changed. But what we do know is it's a transformation. Because it's not about information. It's about transformation. And we begin to, just like Jesus reflected his Father, we begin to reflect the Father. Um, so, footnote here. So we can either focus on our agenda or we focus on Christ. If we focus on Christ, the veil is taken away. If we focus on our agenda, then the veil is placed. If we go to approach somebody to try and tell them how they need to get saved, we've came with an agenda. We've came with the veil that's going to veil their hearts. If we just focus on Christ, Christ is going to speak to them through us. And we can, it can be something so simple as they sneeze and we say, oh, God bless you. And that changed their life. Because it wasn't an agenda. It was just free spirit to touch their heart. And they just wanted, they just need to hear something blessed. They just need to hear the word God. And you happened to just say it because they sneezed. You didn't have an agenda, but it changed their life. That's how quick, that's how easy, that's how simple it is when we walk with what the Holy Spirit is doing. So, question is, check. Is your Christianity filled with legalism and the law of Moses? Is a veil covering your heart? Footnotes. Am I excluding a people group because they are not like me? Am I putting them under a law that does not exist? Am I excluding people because they don't, they don't like me? They don't do the same thing. They don't go to the same kind of church I do. They don't do the things that I do. Am I excluding them? These are my footnotes. What does an unveiled face-to-face -face, no agenda relationship look like? In the face to face. It's getting ready. I can tell you this, it's scary at first. It is scary at first because you got to let go. It's scary at first. We, because what happens when we sit here in this unveiled face to face? And as we do that, we begin to reflect. And what we begin to reflect, we don't like who we become in our darkness. So we begin to see the truth about us and we begin to see that. We, all of our I am not stuff starts coming to the surface. I mean, just boom, 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 starts coming to the surface through different situations, quick and easy, boom, 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 it's there. And we don't like it. Now we're mad at them because we see it in them, but it's rising in us. So this face-to-face -face is going to bring crap up, and you endure. Be quiet and brave enough to listen. You just keep enduring and let it do its work in you. Um, because as, as you're sitting this face to face, remember when I talked about the light, when the light shines on something that was in the darkness in our imagination and the light shines on it, we see the truth about it. So in our imagination, we had this image of what we looked like. And then when the light begins to shine on it, we start going, we start realizing that we don't look like that. We start realizing that that's not really how I look. I thought I looked, I don't look like that. And we don't like it. So when the light begins to shine, you find yourself not liking what you're seeing. But we got to realize he's never rejected us. He isn't going to destroy us. He's going to destroy the thing in us that has caused us to not like ourselves. And as we go in time, we begin to start recognizing ourselves in him and him in ourselves. We doing okay? Because anytime... See, um, yeah. 
See, but he's not judging you. You are. That's the problem. These are my footnotes. When we start realizing that we don't like ourselves. He's not judging us. We are. I'm judging myself that way. I'm eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and I'm trying to tell him what looks good and what looks not good. He's not doing it. I'm doing it. There again, what that is, is that's me taking control again. That's why we have to let go of our agendas and let him do his thing. Otherwise, we get frustrated because we don't like what we see. We have to let go of our agenda. Because we're eating from the tree of knowledge, we're trying to say, we're trying to tell him what looks good. We're trying to tell him how we're supposed to look. This is what looks good, guy. I know what looks good. I've read the law. Yeah. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. It is in the testing that we discover whether our mind is transformed enough to see what Papa is doing. What does it feel like? To feel the power of a magnet. We talked before about this. The I am in you is pulling to I am, the Father. It's pulling you. At the same time, the anti I am, I am not, is that opposite magnet, or that the, 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 just tries to turn away. So there's the struggle. Inside, you are being drawn to him. Externally, or your flesh, or your soul, is trying to turn from him. There's the struggle. There's the, not just getting the barbell above your head, it's the lifting. It's the enduring, that struggle of wanting to turn away and yet still be drawn. Wanting to turn away and yet still be drawn. And you go through life like that. You continue your walk through that way, knowing that he's continually pulling you to himself. He's continually drawing you and changing you on the road to there. He's continually making you into that butterfly as you continue to break out of that old cocoon, that old I am not self. So you're pulled at the same time you're trying to pull away. That's tough. You're being pulled internally, and there's days you go, I can really feel it. And then you hit days where you're like, I just got to turn away. I just got to walk away. This is too tough. And all your crap's coming up, and it's like, it's kind of like, you know, the, the, the water looks clear until you get it starts stirring up, and all that crap starts coming and floating around in there, and you're like, ah! And that's when you want to turn it around away, but he's bringing stuff up to get rid of it. He is going to destroy the sin, the false identity in you. Not just forget about it, he's going to destroy it. Um, Hebrews 5, 8 through 9. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. So now here's it. Once made perfect. What? I thought Jesus was perfect. Hmm. I thought Jesus was perfect. But here it says, He learned obedience from what He suffered, and once made perfect, He became the source of eternal salvation. So He had some growth going in His life, too, that He had to go through and grow through to make it to the cross to be able to stay on the cross. On that cross, he could have at any time called down angels to get him off. He said, you don't take my life, I lay it down. He could have. So he had to spend the first 30 years of his life suffering and enduring this pull toward the Father, turn from the Father. Pull from the Father, turn from the Father. He had to endure that suffering of going through that learning to obey in spite of what he thought and what he felt like doing. He learned to obey that. He learned to sit in this relationship and let all that be dealt with. All that, because he was born in the flesh. The same flesh. He was born in the same flesh that we were born in. So his whole life was being made perfect up until the cross when he laid, when he said before he died, it is finished. It is finished. Yeah. And not only did he finish it for himself, 
finished, he finished it for all of us. For all of us. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And he said it is finished because we have been crucified with Christ. We're going to get into that real quick. Like. So when he went through it, we went through it with him at the same time. But he had to learn it. So, well, well, but I thought he was perfect. No, he was without sin. Why? Because last week we talked about it. Sin, hamartha, had to do with identity. Not your actions, your identity. So he was being made perfect through his obedience and suffering through that testing time, breaking out of the cocoon, learning to be quiet and be brave enough to listen. He was breaking through that and was without sin because he never forgot his identity. It had to do with Satan coming at him in the, in the desert, right? And saying, if you are a son of God, See? A test of identity. And he said, nope, I'm not going to play your games. I'm not going to argue with about my identity. I know who I am. This is what Scripture says. He, he never lost his identity. He never lost his identity. If we start looking at sin, not about behavior, but about identity, because your identity always causes you to act that way. When you think you're this way, you act that way. That's the way it comes up. <laughs> you okay, dear? <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm memorizing at the same time. Okay. Applying to what you're talking about. Okay. All right. Good. So, what does obedience look like? Obedience look like trust. It says he learned obedience by by through his suffering. What does obedience? It trust. He learned to trust his father. Mm -hmm. So, there's two ways you obey. You either obey out of fear or you obey out of trust. And if you trust, then you obey because I just trust you it's going to be okay. If it's fear, as soon as that fear is gone, you're going back to doing it your way. And there's no faith. And there's no, there's no faith. And we're never made perfect. It says, perfect love casts out fear because fear has to do with punishment. And those that fear will not be made perfect. But it took Jesus' whole life to become be made perfect. Yeah. That's what we're doing now. We're on uh -huh. journey to be made perfect. Right. And you have to be perfect to enter into the kingdom of heaven, but that's what he's doing now. He's and that's see that's people. what he did. He is he is he freed us. Yeah. So that we can sit here as he would sit here with his father and allow the father to change us and deal with all this stuff that we deal with. Yeah. But we have to sit there to for it to happen. We have to learn obedience through what we suffer. And the suffering is the sitting in there when you want to get away. Yeah. It's the standing in there when you want to turn your, your way. I want to just go back to my old life. I just, this is too tough. I want to go back to my old way of being. And you sit in there and you hang in there. It's not, I'm going to be so brave, I'm going to do it. It's just, I'm going to hang in there. I'm going to sit there and let Father work on me. I'm going to let Father work on me. Okay. What does suffering look like? Let me tell you, it is feeling the pain of watching them make wrong choices and letting them. Here it is. You cannot make somebody free. Because as soon as you make them free, that's not freedom. Because now you're in control of making them free. Freedom is a choice. So suffering is giving them the choice, even though you know what the freedom is, and they're not choosing freedom stuff. And so you suffer because just like the Holy Spirit does with us. When the Holy Spirit says, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go down there. I would not go down that road. I would not get involved with that. Don't do that. I would not do that. You hear that coming from that still small voice inside of you, right? Something in my gut was telling me not to do that. You know, you guys know what I'm talking about. And yet you go ahead and do it anyway. You ignore that little voice and do it anyway. And the Holy Spirit says, okay, I'll go with you. I'll go suffer with you while you're doing your thing until you get tired of doing that thing, and then we'll, we'll try it again. That's the suffering. That's the suffering, knowing that you have the answer to freedom. I know people in my life right now, I know I have the answer for their freedom, but I can't make them free. I can't force them to be free. That's taking away their free will. Choose the freedom. They have to choose freedom. Mm -hmm. The only thing I can do is sit here and suffer, hoping that they see something in me that makes them decide they want freedom too. <clears throat> That's what I got to do. 
Okay. All right. What does perfection look like? Perfection looks like asleep in the boat during the storm. That's what Jesus did. Remember the storm and he just slept in the boat? That's perfection because you are at such rest and such trust in your Father, you're not worried about anything on earth harming you because you know that the whole world is in his hand. <laughs> she was singing that earlier today. <laughs> Because you know that, and you know that you can trust Him. And that's our problem. That's why we don't sleep in the boat. That's why we can't even freak out. Because we don't really think that He is going to take care of us. We don't really think that He really wants what's best for me. Really? We, we get so caught up in this, trying to build our own life stuff, that when it doesn't go the way we think, think it's supposed to go, we think that he's abandoned us. And no, he hasn't abandoned us, never. What we may be going through is just a cleaning house of crap that we've built from maybe 5, 10, 15, 30, 40 years ago. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to keep going on how, how long we've been building crap. But uh, <laughs> so I know. I know. You know, I mean, we build it up, and then when he starts working on us because we give him permission and things start falling apart in our life, and we're going, what's going on? This ain't right. And now we're trying to take control again. We just got to go, all right, I'm going to let go of that boat. I don't know what's going on, but I trust you. I don't understand, but I trust you. And we're coming to that place, and he's working on us through all that. We're breaking out of the cocoon. And we're not just wanting that trophy. We're going through the process. Because it's not about the trophy. The trophy has no meaning. It's the process of getting to that that changes us. That's what the word value is. John 14. 12. Or John 12. 44 through 46. I'm sorry. Then Jesus cried that, Whoever believes in me does not believe in me alone, but in the one who sent me. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Quote from James Finley. Our longing for God is an incarnate echo of God's longing for us. Our very desire to know God is God wanting to know us. That's what draws us to him. It's him wanting to know us, and so we are, he's pulling us to him. So awesome. He's like, I want to know you. Yeah. So uh, the echo effect, it's like that tuning fork, right? And so as it's, as it's tuning, the I am in you begins to tune with it. See, that's just it. All the instruments tune to the tuning fork, not the tuning fork to the instruments. That's where we mess up. We think Jesus is supposed to tune to my life. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No. It's him, me. He starts that, and that vibration starts in me, tuning to him. And as that vibration happens, all kinds of crap starts breaking off and it just becomes like a mess sometimes and then it gets better and then it's like a mess again and, and so that's just what happens. That vibration as you're being tuned begins to change you. And sometimes it looks messy before it looks better. So it's like the tuning fork. Okay. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. It doesn't say hear your awesome words. To see your good deeds. So you spend time here, 
and people begin to recognize you. Not because of what you said, not what you quoted, but because your light, the light in you, begins to shine. All right. The echo effect. Um, oh, here it is. Side note for the echo effect. Are you echoing or creating your own noise? So, <laughs> are you echoing the Father or are you creating your own noise? Yeah, good choice. John 9, 5. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. What? He just said that you are the light of the world. Now he's saying he is the light of the world. Because his hand was in you. Come on. <laughs> there it is. That's why I said, are you echoing or are you making your own noise? Because you are expression of him. So my footnote, when, when he is the light, you are the light. When they see you, they hear his echo. WWJD is separation. Now, what would Jesus do? Because that is be like, um, be like Jesus. I will be like Jesus. That's the same thing that he said in the garden. Don't you know if you eat from this fruit, you will be like God? WWJD has good intentions. Let's just memorize what Jesus did. Let's don't get to know him. Let's memorize the things he did and then go do those things. But you got to go to the next level and spend time here so that you start looking like him. So that you will be the light of the world. Just as he is the light of the world. Don't, and he's a footnote, don't think what to do. Do what he is doing. That's present. What is Jesus doing? Present tense. Not from a book. What would Jesus do is from a book. What is Jesus doing is present tense today, right now, in this class, when you leave this class, tomorrow morning when you wake up, what is Jesus doing? That's where he wants us. Not memorizing a book that he did and the, the, the things that he did and just go do those things. Because maybe that won't work in that country. Because they have different traditions and different mindsets. So when you go to that country, you got to be what Jesus is doing in that country. Not what he did in that country. What is he doing here? Not what he did there. That's why we got to get rid of that just trying to mimic him. Um... What's not real or true will not reflect the light. Only the truth of your being can reflect the light of his presence. You gotta chew on that one for a while. False self is no reflective, has no reflective ability, except for in the imagination of the fallen mind. Truth always eventually reveals the truth of the false self. Fruit eventually ripens on the tree. Here it is. No matter how hard you may try to keep your crap or your scuba hidden, it eventually ripens on the tree. It eventually comes up. Ah. The reflection effect. Proverbs 27, 19. As water reflects the face, so one's life reflects the heart. So others reflect your heart back. That was a footnote. In the Passion Translation, that was actually the footnote that it had in there. So others reflect your heart back to you. I've uh, got a quote here from Ram Das. We are all just walking each other home. Oh, wow, that's good. Hmm. We are all just walking each other home. Eckhart Tolle, another quote. Ultimately, there is no one else. You're always finding yourself. <laughs> that's a good one. You're always running into yourself, and then do you like you or do you not like you? That's the question to be answered when you're running into yourself. Do you like you or do you not like you? And as you spend time in the face-to-face -face and let this begin to do his work in you, you start liking you. Love your neighbor as yourself because your neighbor is yourself. But you can't love your neighbor as yourself if you don't love yourself. That's why you don't like them because you don't like you. We can't love our neighbor as ourselves when we don't like ourselves because our neighbor is ourselves. Does that make sense? Okay. The reflection effect. 
Just as the eye receives the light into the back of the eye and then reflects the image seen back onto the lens, so we, as we look at Papa in our face-to-face -face relationship, receive his light and image into our souls, reflecting them back to him and to the rest of the world. See, it's in the face-to-face -face we begin to reflect his glory to everybody else around us. It begins to, it begins to be an imprint on our soul that then reflects out. And so instead of the I am not, we have his glory so that begins to reflect that. Stop mimicking him and start reflecting him. Right, stop mimicking and start reflecting. Yeah. But in order to reflect, you have to go to the mirror to reflect. That's right. You have to spend time in the mirror. It has to be a present. And you know what, I can go to the mirror and then if I walk away, because I'm no longer present with the mirror, I'm not reflecting anymore. It's staying present. It's learning how to stay present and, and at all times. When you're mimicking, you can walk to the mirror and look in the mirror, but as soon as you walk away, you forget what you see in the mirror. Yeah. Because you're only mimicking. Because you're just mimicking. you're reflecting. It's present tense. It's present. It's present yeah. tense. What's it's happening? Real. It's real. It's real. It That's right. Heart. That's right. So that is true about your eye. Yeah. It comes in to the back of your eye, and then it reflects to the front of the eye, and then your brain sees it off the front of your eye, what you're seeing. Just like the camera lens does the same kind of thing, reflects it back. That's how we are. We will reflect back to others to see. And at the same time, we're reflecting, and also when we come into contact with others, we're reflecting. We're reflecting him, and we're, and we're reflecting ourselves off of them, back to ourselves. Okay, when Father God sees you, he sees Jesus. Ephesians 2, 4 through 10. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we are dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ, seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. Excuse me. is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. So. Christ. Christ. Created in Christ. In advance. For things for us to do. Created in Christ. Whatever happened to Christ happened to to everything in Christ. So when he went to the cross, all of creation in Christ went to the cross with him. When he died, all of creation died that death. When he rose, all of creation rose. When he ascended to the Father, all of creation ascended to the Father. We are not out here trying to make things happen. He did it. It's not us, i quote Baxter Kruger here, he said, he says, the gospel is not you inviting Jesus into your life. The true gospel is that Jesus invited you to share in his life. Because he's the Christ. And Jesus invited you to share in his life with his Father. We think we invite him in, but he invited us in because from one man, he made all the nations. And so Jesus, the head, the first fruits. And now let's just see what Paul, because Paul the Apostle, he also saw this. Let's go on. The warning effect, Colossians 3, 1 through 4. Therefore, if or since you have been raised up with Christ, with Christ, raised up with Christ, not after, with Christ. You have been raised up with Christ, present tense. Keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the, on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. I say revealed in you and through you. Passion translation. Uh, 3 verse 4 says, in that same Colossians 3 4 says, As Christ himself is seen for who he really is, 
who you are will also be revealed, for you are now one with him in his glory. You are now one with him in his glory. The wedding effect on the right hand side, Galatians 2.20, Passion Translation. My old identity has been co-crucified with Christ. Co-crucified at the same time with co-crucified with the Messiah and no longer lives. For the nails of his cross, what? Crucified. crucified me with him. When he was nailed to the cross, I was with him when it happened. And now the essence of this new life is no longer mine. For the anointed one lives his life, where? Through me. We live in union as one. My new life is empowered by the faith of the Son of God who loves me so much that he gave himself for me and dispenses his life into mine. You said it earlier, Trapper. He is the light. We are the light. How's that happen? Because it's his light shining through us. It's exactly it. The warning effect. What does Jesus say in John 14, 20? In that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. One day you're going to realize that that happened. From one man, he created all the nations and set their times and their boundaries and when they will be. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. Here it is. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of how many? All. Who is over all, and through all, and in all. That kind of sums it up, this relationship right here, and where we are in this relationship. We just need to spend some time sitting in this face-to-face, -face, allowing it to start changing who we think we are so that we can come back to our true identity, which is the one that he gave us when he knit us together in his mother's womb. Uh, our mother's womb. 2 Corinthians 5, 14-19. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, anytime you see a therefore, you need to back up and see what's it there for. So when we see this therefore in verse 16, that therefore is because one died for all, therefore all died. One died for all, therefore all died. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him this way no longer. Therefore, what's the therefore? One died for all, therefore all died. Therefore, anyone, or since anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all things are from God, and reconciled, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the world of, word of reconciliation. So God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. When? At the cross. At the cross, all that, the world was reconciled. We start seeing that go from, go from me to we, we start seeing we're a part of the bigger picture and we start knowing where we are, already are, we are his expression in the earth and creation. Now, quick thing, we got five minutes. We're going to do this five minutes. Um, what I had planned, I did, I took too long to stop. But let me talk about meditation. Let me talk about this face-to-face, -face, this sitting here face-to-face. -face. There, there's, it's called uh, Lectio de Vida. Um, there are different ways. If you start with, with Lectio de Vida, a good way to start with this is... Read scripture. Don't get like, I'm going to read like a oh, chapter. I'm going to read, you know, 15 verses. It doesn't matter where you start. Feel, just go someplace you feel comfortable to start. I would suggest New Testament. It's a good place to start. Maybe the book of John. And you read. 
slow, on purpose, focusing on the words, on each word as you read it. And when a word jumps out at you, ha, huh, meditate on it. Think about it. What does that mean? How does that apply to my life? Just don't go, then don't go any further reading. No more reading. You're done reading. You are focused on that word. You could spend the rest of the day thinking about that verse, that word. What is it saying to me? How does that apply in my life? That's a good way to start your Lectio Divina uh, meditation time. It's a good way to start that kind of a, getting you kind of focused. It gets you focused. It starts bringing your focus into a certain spot. Um, there are other meditation ways, too. Um, Lectio Divina is a good way to start your journey of, of meditation. And then you move on to, they have centering prayer, they have focus prayer, there are, there's, there's different kinds of meditation you can do. Um, one, and I've, I've tried different ones. Um, one that I like to do also, which I haven't done in a little while, but I like to do, is you focus on something like, like Jill, she, like, I like this last fall, she started putting flowers from the garden on the kitchen table where I'm in there doing my meditation time. And I could focus on the flower and I could just focus on the intricate beauty of even just one flower and just enjoy the beauty of that flower and look at the detail and let it just wash over me the beauty of Papa's creation and let myself kind of enjoy his creation with his enjoyment for his creation. Uh, another form of meditation is another focus meditation is where you sit and you're like, you focus on your breath, you close your eyes and you focus on your breath, you feel your breath come in, you feel your breath leave, you can focus on your breath, you focus on your heartbeat, you, you're, what you're doing is you're getting rid of all those other thoughts going on in your head and you're focusing into one spot so you're not bombarded with thoughts. So you can do the focus on your breath, focus on your heartbeat, Focus on a part of your body and just spend time focusing on it, feeling it, feeling the spirit, feeling your breath, feeling the blood flow to that area. You get really focused. Another form of meditation is the mantra meditation, where you repeat the same sentence over and over and over, over and over and over. And it, it gets you out of your mind because now you're focused on this mantra. That's where the prayer beats. People have prayer beats. They will, they will pray through that. They'll pray through those prayer beats. And they'll focus on that, which gets you out of your head. The purpose of the, the meditation is to get you out of the way so that Father God can talk to you. And now my favorite one is the one I shared with Jerry, is the, is the centering prayer, and it's just about letting go. It's like, it's like the river, okay? So this is kind of how I see it when I do it, is, um, is I see this bright light, and there's this river that's going into the bright light. And you can't really... See where it is, because it just disappears. You know, you look deeply into the light. You look, and you can't see anything because the light is so bright. So I kind of see that. And then what happens is, in the letting go, is thoughts come at you. Always, there's always thoughts. So you're you're looking like upriver. You're looking upriver in your mind. Your eyes are closed. You have a deep breath, and then you you have what's called like a sacred word. A sacred word. There's nothing sacred about it. It'd be whatever it is. Like pause, rest, peace, Jesus, Papa. I thought about using bacon, but if I said bacon, I'd be thinking about bacon then. <laughs> so I didn't use bacon. So you got to use, and the purpose of the, the sacred word is whenever you feel the thoughts coming at you, you say this word to remind you to turn your focus back to God. To turn your focus back to God. And when these thoughts come at you, they come at you like boats coming down the river. So they come at you like boats coming down the river. Don't try and get rid of them. Don't try and grab them and throw them to the side. Don't try and deal with them. Because when the thoughts start coming at you, your mind, and those thoughts, you start checking out the thought. You start thinking about that thought. You start making plans with that thought. And it could be a future thought or a past thought or a regret or a hope or whatever. And you start focusing on that thought. Next thing you know, five minutes have gone by and you haven't even thought about God because you're focused on your thought. And so you're like, oh. So then you say your word. Pause. Pause. And it helps you to let go of it. You just let go of it and let it go on downstream because it will, they will constantly come 
and they will constantly keep going. Thoughts always come and go. Always. You are bombarded every day by millions of thoughts that come and go. So when you're in your centering prayer, you turn your focus, and when the thought starts coming at you, you don't have to worry about it. You just ignore it and just let it go right past you. And you stay focused. And then here's another one. And you just let it go. And then you'll get caught up and you'll find yourself thinking about it. And when you do, that's when your, your word comes in. And it, and it causes you to turn around. Um, John, uh, or Thomas Keating, was, was teaching this meditation prayer uh, to some nuns. And one of the nuns came to him afterwards and she goes, Man, she goes, I, I think I had like 10,000 thoughts that just bombarded my brain. And he said, oh, praise God, you had 10,000 opportunities to turn back to God. So you, you, don't, you don't worry about it. If you get caught up, you just, you just remember, oh, Papa, pop, you turn, pause. Whatever your word is, you just, yeah, you just let go of that thought and let it go. Because you can spend the rest of the day on that thought. You could be, and it, it, well, well what, if it's a, what if it's from God? Well, if it's from God, you'll remember it later. So you just let it go. And so the, the centering prayer is all about letting go. It's about letting go. When you spend time here, if you're working, trying to work and figure out what to fix in all of this, you're caught up in it. And nothing's changing because you're caught up in it. But when you start just letting go, changes are happening that you have no idea what's being changed. You just know you're different. And sometimes, I mean, for me, I've been doing it for two months. And when I first started, like I said, it was like two minutes. I was like, wow, this is going to take a long time. I'm never going to make this. Now I can, I can sit and I can just let go. And sometimes it takes like the first five, maybe seven minutes, ten minutes. And then I feel myself falling into that rhythm of just letting stuff go. And I may have... 30 seconds of nothing. And then you catch yourself going, hey, I wasn't thinking about nothing. Oh, now I'm thinking about not thinking about nothing. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And you're like, oh, so you're okay, okay, pop. You turn your focus back again, and, and then the timer's up at 20 minutes or 10 minutes or a half hour. And then you just sit there. You're, when your time's up, you sit there and you breathe for about a good 30 seconds. Just breathe, eyes closed, and kind of come back to the surface and then you find your peace. And then the, the trick is, you learn to spend time there, and not just when you're out of it going, oh, now I'm just back to, back to what life. You start learning to take it with you when you go on your day. And even when you're out on your day and you're on the road, dealing with people, whatever, and you find your bombarded stuff, you stop for just 10 seconds, one minute, and just breathe and catch your breath and just kind of let things go and let go, let go of all this crap that's happening, let go of the chaos, let go of the traffic, let go of it all, and then as that peace starts to come back and you carry that with you. And as you keep practicing and practicing and practicing, it gets a little bit easier, a little bit easier, your duration is longer, pretty soon your day is filled with just off and on times of peace when you're able to just let it go. I know that after you and I had talked, you know, I. I use the word pause and uh, you were using the word rest, rest. and um, we discussed a lot about letting go and so I kind of got it to the point now where I kind of combine the three and I'll, I'll, I'll go into a pause and then take a deep breath and that's my rest, a rest. and then I let it go and that starts to give me that yeah. period. then every time one of those thoughts come I gotta go again yeah, and you keep doing it. And you keep doing it. Yeah, exactly. And the reason I switched to rest, I was doing Papa, and I switched to rest because I realized that this is the time to rest, not the time to repair everything I need to repair in my life. So this is the time to rest. So I began to just focus on rest. Yeah. So, all right, good to go. Trapper's leaving. <laughs> oh. <laughs>